Hello and welcome everyone to an, another episode of the Flying Changes show. I'm Jenny Winterleach and I am joined today by the amazing, the incredible, the uh, um, opinionated <laughs> Freddie Steele. Uh, Freddie, welcome. Thank you, thank you. So Freddie, you describe yourself as a trick rider and a horseman. Yeah, um, it's hard to categorize what I actually do. Um, if you're on my social medias or know me at all, I do a little bit of everything. Um, some days I shoot arrows, bows and arrows of horses. Other days I'll be dragged along by a snowboard behind a horse. Other days I'll be doing a work and equitation competition and then other days teaching uh, naughty horses how to how to load. So uh, yeah, it all changes. Um, it all changes day to day. Um, my passion is in horse training and horse behaviour. Um, that's really where um, my passion lies and why I got into horses and, and started horses. Um, but for a bit of fun as well, I travel around the world uh, doing horseback archery. So it's a sport, um, like what it says on the tin, galloping down the track with a bow and arrow, shooting at targets. And then... Uh, okay. Added to that, uh, trick riding as well. So jumping cool. on and the horses, hanging upside down, climbing around the neck, around the belly, all that sort of thing. Um, but that's got a, a shorter life shelf, shall we say, um, because my body will soon <laughs> give up uh, with those sort of things. Um, but it's all it's all good fun and getting to go around and, and learn about different cultures and how they use horses and have used horses in the past and what they what they do with them nowadays so um these cool. smaller sports i really love really love these smaller sports and finding yeah. out more about them and diverging Wicked. into cultures on that so you are multi-talented multifaceted, but it sounds to me like you're just someone who's just fascinated and interested in anything to do with horses in any way any shape any form and I mean, a lot of people probably know you from the trick riding because that's the piece that, uh, you know, you're on you're on stages or well, not stages, either they're arenas and you're doing things and you're showing it off to people and people say, wow, you know, that's probably what I think a lot of people see you doing. Um, but actually, there's so much more to it than that. So what I want to do then is just start off by telling us. How on earth did you get into horses? Where did it all begin? Tell us little baby Freddie. Tell us about, it's not too, actually, that wasn't that long ago for you, really, was it? But, you know, tell us tell us about how it all began. Yeah, so uh, over, what am I now, 25? So over 20 years ago, when I was four, I got into horses through my mum um, and a very traditional way, started riding at a riding school um, and got into it more and more and more, working towards pony club and then uh, learned a pony and started doing all sorts of pony club stuff like your typical child would do. Um, from there, uh, I moved up and up and up till it was time to move on to horses. And then uh, I made a big jump from a 13-2 pony to a 16-hand horse because that was the only horse in between, if that makes sense. And as some of you know, I'm quite tall. I'm six foot three. Um, so I quickly outgrew this 13 two pony. And my instructor at the time had a 16 hand Irish um, sports horse, I think she was. So it quickly went from riding around the pony club ring to having to learn to ride properly. Because, of course, I got on this horse. My legs didn't go past the saddle flap. And this horse was well trained. It wasn't just a pony you point and go and kick. It was one that you actually had to ride. So it was a big step um, for me at that point. I was 15, 14, 14, I think I was. Um, and then moved up to learn to ride this horse or learn to ride properly so to speak rather than just learn to sort of hang on and point and go the way the way we want to go so that was a big step for me um from pony to horse because it, it wasn't just a small yes a 14 2 pony then a 15 and move up it was straight from the 13 2 to the 16 hand um and the styles in which they were trained were very different uh my my trainer at the time is a really close friend and i'm still friends with her now um and she was the one that taught me to ride from the start rather than just 
hang on, so to speak. Uh, she was very interested in natural horsemanship herself, although was uh, self-taught and learning all about it herself. This was when uh, natural horsemanship was a lot newer to society and uh, it was something that um, wasn't that well known about. So there wasn't that many trainers and you had to sort of go out and teach yourself if that was, that was what you wanted to do. So she did that um, and with that came my horse training um, passion, if you like. I was always, I was always passionate about behaving animals my mum was a dog trainer my granddad was a police dog trainer um so I've always had training animals in my family and I think his dad actually trained racing pigeons or something my mum seemed to tell me so there's always been some sort of animal training in the family and it was just a matter of time I think to what animal I was gonna train um so that's when that's when the horse training started that's when the let's not just ride, let's do some groundwork, let's teach our horse to do things that other horses can't do or teach things that are a bit more advanced and, and all sorts of things like that, really. Um, and that's where that's where the passion started. So I was uh, volunteering at a yard um, as I was finishing school and I spent more time at the yard than I did at school um, and eventually ended up leaving school early and getting offered uh, an apprenticeship or a, a sort of student working student uh, basis on this yard um, and that went from there really it was like I worked at McDonald's some days petrol stations some evenings and with the horses the other time because the horses uh, didn't really pay at that point it was very much working at other places to pay for me to go and have my education learning with the horses and the lady I worked for she bought horses in for training and all sorts of things like that so I learned all the cases the extreme cases um, the not so extreme ones back in and and the different mindset very much from western I suppose it's more of a horseman western cowboy mindset um, that we were teaching teaching these horses in so I was there for seven eight years um, learning this eventually it started getting paid a little bit then a little bit more and I quit my McDonald's job and then kept to the petrol station a bit longer quit that job it's very very much a yeah we have to jump into this two feet um joined school I wanted to work in horses but mum was always like horses don't pay well enough um and I didn't really ever do anything active about pursuing any career because I was sort of stuck in this middle ground and I think at that age 15 16 when you're having to make choices at school of what you want to do that it is a daunting time so I didn't really actively pursue anything I just kept going down the yard to ride the horses and learn about the horses so it naturally naturally took that step when I left school and got that opportunity um and then yeah it went from there really so I was with her for seven seven or eight years and then wanted to start up a little bit more on my own I didn't want to take the jump into I'm now going to just be a horse trainer um because I didn't have the clientele I didn't have the knowledge I hadn't done any um on my own that weren't overshadowed by someone else so that's in training horses um so I've done the processes from start to finish but it was always under someone else's name um then I went to a yard that rented me out a stable and a field um, but also gave me the opportunity to be a student at their stunt yard so that's where I learned the trick riding and horse archery side of things and it allowed me to bring my own clients in one at a time one horse came in for training for six weeks eight weeks and I'd do that before work and after work and then during the work time I'd, I'd teach um People horseback archery, trick riding. Uh, they'd teach me more. Uh, the people I work for, and that's that's how that side of things grew. So I didn't really know what I was walking into from that side of side of things. I just saw the opportunity to set up my own uh, clientele base without going solely renting a yard and, and jumping in. So that transition was really key um, for me to be able to afford to live and and have backup four horses uh, that maybe were difficult and other things I had support around me. Um, so that three three years there really was the start of 
me as my training business and also exploring the world meeting new people and doing these different things amazing and as is often the case if you haven't specifically got a goal where you go that is what I want that is what I want and you find a way to get it you kind of you drift around you find things and if you're just following what's right for you which clearly you were like you didn't know why or what or how but you wanted to be around horses and you knew that that's what you wanted to do and it's interesting because it's the same story that I had I was constantly told by my completely non-horsey family there's no money in horses there's no money in horses you will just be poor you you you, why do you want to do that there's no money in horses surely you don't want to be scrabbling around all the time for it but if you listen to the people around you that are saying that stuff you'll never go and pursue that dream or you'll never go and and do what you want to do so if you can find the people that actually don't believe that or have found a way or are doing it and surround yourself with them what a difference it makes and it sounds like that was that yard for you or or indeed that trainer to begin with where she she helped you to get into to what you want how much do you believe that that's true freddie that you've surrounded yourself with the people that can absolutely because i was thrown into that yard because i was there riding anyway at at school at the same time and then when she gave me the opportunity um to take well at the time it was my only opportunity so i took it and then pretty soon after i was like yes this is what i want to do um it wasn't until i was there in the moment doing it that i realized actually yeah this is what i want and i'm quite fortunate i think in that pretty quickly i I worked out that that is what I wanted to do and then have my drive from that because many people I talk to, my friends and other other younger people in the industry or even people um, my sort of age, um, they don't know for a while that that's what they want to do and the middle ground and the middle time um, is is time wasted in some ways if if it ends up being the thing that you want to do because you've lost a couple of years of that drive of, yes throw yourself and the commitment into it um so having having the goal of i want to be a horse trainer from from a young age um but also being thrown into that situation was key and i think i think the place it all happened and it was all i hate to say it could be cliche but meant to be because i got offered the job at that yard um pretty soon after i left school and things like that and I think, you know, I hate the word luck. I don't think luck exists. You'll never hear me at a competition say good luck to anyone. I always say have fun. Because as far as I'm concerned, luck is basically just a culmination of the right things happening at the right time. Now, so yes, some of them might be out of your control. But if you hadn't put the work in, if you hadn't known what you wanted, if you hadn't been willing to take the risk, if you hadn't, you know, listened to people, trained hard, done anything like that, then it wouldn't happen. So it's not luck. It's just a culmination. And like you say, yeah, I mean, people say it, 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 all, it all happened for the right reason. But that if you had still been working at the petrol station or if you'd gone into an office job or something, then it wouldn't have. So there's, you know, luck is luck is only really something where, OK, something that's outside of your control just happens to align with what you really want. But if you don't know what that is, then how are you, how are you going to know? So let's yeah. get on to, because I know a lot of people here are listening in because, yep, they want to know about the horsemanship side of things. And I think that's fascinating. We'll get on to it. But they also want to know about this thing called trick riding. Now, let's just clear something up. A lot of people say you're a stunt rider. And I was away at something with you guys recently and you kept going, no, it's not stunt riding. It's trick riding. So what's the difference? Let's just clarify this now while we can. So in the in the industry, stunt um, would be film work so a stunt may be a fall it may be a rear uh it may be something like that a vehicle to horse transfer or something where it's usually done in a film so to speak there's not many films that have trick riding in them and trick riding is um the tricks that you are doing as a gymnast on the horse um so i think heartland is or yeah, I think Heartland's the only thing out that is trick riding in a film, or the, the, the most common one. Um, so the trick riding is performing tricks on the horse. Stunt is the stuff we see in films, the saws, the shields, the rears, the falls, that sort of thing. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a divide that <laughs> people in the industry get a little bit sometimes 
I do one or the other, but it all the same people do both, if that makes sense. So that's where the um, that's where the clash comes, really. But it's not so much a clash; it's it's just a slight difference in in what we're doing with the horses. Cool. Okay. So, but you do trick riding mostly. Uh, yeah, mostly trick riding. I've done I've done stuff in films and before and things like that, commercials that have been. Can you rear up on this horse? And we need to get a shot of that. And that's what the class is. is more stunt riding. And which do you prefer? Trick riding. Bye -bye. Okay, cool. So tell us then about trick riding. What is it? I mean, some of us have seen you do it. Some of us have seen you do it live. Some of us have managed to see the behind the scenes as well, which is quite interesting. Um, you know, and 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 I'd I'd love to know what is it that you love about trick riding? What is it that that is the real skill of trick riding? I mean, most of us watch and think, well, you're mad. Um, and I, quite frankly, I can't get on my horse without a mountain block. So watching the way that you bounce on and off it when it's cantering along is ridiculous. <laughs> Tell us more. Okay, so trick riding. Um, I got into it through the through the team I was working for, like I said previously, and um, met some Cossacks from Russia, um, including the world champion in the sport. So there is actually a sport of it's called Jigatovka. Okay, um, jig it. Tovka is how you say it. Um, it's a Russian word, of course, um, because trick riding really originates from the Cossacks in Russia. So they hold a world championships every year and it's actually combined. So it's trick riding is one section and then the next section is weaponry work because it's all based on Cossacks. And of course, Cossacks are military people um, who are very strong and very powerful in history. So they tried to make a sport, or they haven't tried, they have made a sport um, that judges your uh, combat horsemanship, I suppose, in general. So how good would you be in battle um, in history? So you have swords, lance, guns, throwing knives, bows and arrows, and specific targets to hit. And then you have to perform six tricks. So there's a catalogue of tricks that you choose from that are categorised level one to level four based on difficulty and just like a dressage test for each trick you'll get a mark out of 10 for that trick now what they're looking for in trick riding and the best trick riders in the world are like gymnasts on horses okay gymnasts always are light moving around the uh, well the horse in this case or whatever they're moving around um, in their gymnastics uh, they have straight legs pointy toes good body tension and it all looks easy and elegant that's what we want to achieve with trick riding. There's a lot of people in the world that do trick riding that don't compete in at sport. They just do it for show. And uh, because it's not that popular and people love the jumping on and off and doing this cool stuff, they don't realise the difference between the good trick riding and the not good trick riding. And that's down to opinion as well. So in america they have a different opinion of what's good trick riding compared to russia compared to uh, france and europe many people have different opinions of what's the best trick riding in france for example they don't mind about straight legs and pointy toes they just want quick fast don't care how it's done get it done quick 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 so it looks cooler um on the other hand the russians and how i've been taught and how i like is the elegance in which you're doing the tricks as well if that makes sense um so you always want to want to do straight legs pointed toes look elegant and make it nice on the horse it's it's very much um you as a rider that's being judged and being marked but taken into consideration is the horse as well. You don't want to be landing hard on the horse's back or pulling the horse over. You've got to, you've got to look after your horse. Um, and that's judged in competition as well. If you land hard on the saddle from jumping back on, then they're going to mark you right down. They're going to say, no, that's not, not a good movement because you've, you've had a detrimental effect of landing landing hard on the horse. So these things are taken into consideration, which is really good for for the welfare of the horse and the sport and everything like that and trying to get this this sport to grow um, at the moment i think the sport has around 10 10 countries um that enter uh, obviously it's been a bit up and down the last couple of years because of covid and cancelled and things like that so it really needs to get going again on the on the world stage um but 
believe it or not, it's it's an all age sport. There's four year olds going around with swords bigger than them, and then the guy that created the sport originally, he is how old is he now? I think he's seventy one, maybe, and he's still trick riding on the horse, standing up on the horse. <laughs> reaching down, picking something up off the floor at a gallop, jumping on and off, upside down. He didn't get into riding normally until he was 50 years old. So that, for me, is a massive, massive, massive inspiration and has to be to anyone. Not starting riding until you're 50 and being 70 and still hanging upside down off the horse. Yes, he may be Russian, but if he can do it, then then loads of other, other people can do it. Um, and yes, he hasn't had the years and years of of hitting the floor and your knees your knees go pretty quick you speak to a trick rider your knees will go quick if you don't don't take care but um yeah that's that's really um trick riding as as i know it and i go over to russia two or three times a year to train with my friend who was previous world champion and also to compete in the world championship for britain and also to practice uh, competitions as well because the big thing is it's such a small sport there's no competitions in this country um so i have to go over to russia to to practice my competitions and also for the big competition so i try and get over as much as possible as much as uh, for covid and expenses and and life in general allows um but doing other competitions in horseback archery working equitation whatever it may be helps with my competition um form i suppose because in the early years i went out it's my one competition a year and it was the world championship and it's like oh my god now you have to perform and it's like great i haven't quite done the preparation in competitions because i did the preparation at home uh, but everyone knows in your own arena you can go around and get the best score you'd ever done but go out there put it in front of people and judges and marked and and whatever the environment may be it's very different so uh, yeah, I've been working a lot during lockdown on uh, and and carrying on with competing, having pressure and, and dealing with it in different ways. And so how do you then train for the pressure when there isn't any? Because this is something I think a lot of people are suddenly realising again is we were all training during lockdown and our horses were going forwards and, you know, we make great progress. And then you come out and you put yourself back in that competition arena again. And if there's any chance of performance anxiety, it smacks you between the eyes. So, you know, it's really interesting to hear like you saying exactly that, which is I have to go to some competitions to train under pressure. And I think in a lot of the equine world, in the in the amateur world, not so much the professional world, people see every competition like they have to go and do well. It's a competition. But I think actually sometimes I say to people, look, sack it off as training and go and train in the fact that you need to be in those whiteboards. You need to be under pressure. You need to be in your kit. Your horse needs to sit and sack it off as training. But how do you, how do you then train for pressure? Um, a big thing was is starting working equitation. So my biggest thing was always trick riding um, and the trick riding competitions meant the most to me. So I'd say on a, on a it was actually a training competition in Russia, but I'd say this one doesn't count. It doesn't matter. It's preparation for the world world championship. But because I cared about the sport and doing well that much, I don't think my mind computed what I was trying to say to myself on that occasion. Um, and coming away and starting work in equitation, I very much started that sport on a, let's use it as preparation for other things that I care more about. And actually doing that, I think helped no end because I didn't put any pressure on myself because I generally thought this is preparation for something else. And it's, it's not until recently i've actually realized that uh, maybe that's why i've done done well in in some work in equitation competitions this year because the pressure hasn't been on i haven't put the pressure on myself and i'm sort of the person that will put the pressure on myself more and a lot of people will put the pressure on yourself more than anyone else will um, and i think the fact that being in this country it's been a smaller crowd it's it's been a lower level all those things have benefited me no end so i think uh for the people that like jenny was saying are into dressage or showing or jumping and things like that if you have the one that you care about a lot um and then maybe go to a different side so if you're a dressage rider 
and and you're getting back into it and you're nervous in the dressage arena maybe go to a showing competition or, or something else because you've still got the pressure of a crowd and a competition but it's not necessarily the one you care about the most and that seems to have helped me a little bit in recent years um because you have got to have that that bit of pressure but if you have that pressure combined with your own personal pressure that's what makes things sort of blow up and and not make you perform your best in in those sort of situations so that's what's helped me an actual as a matter of fact starting work in equitation with that mindset it's sort of changed quite quickly because i started with oh yeah it'll be a bit fun we'll do it whatever and it'll help other aspects of of what i want to improve but actually now i care a bit more about work and equitation and i want to move up the levels and i want to i want to now do really well at that because that's just my competitive nature um but the mindset of how i went into it i think has helped me as an individual with performance anxiety and competition anxiety so to speak has helped and don't get me wrong i didn't i didn't crumble under the the big pressures um and stuff like that but i never performed to my very best um and maybe that's because i've only done well i've done under 10 uh international competitions and maybe i need more time at international competition to improve improve that area but um i'm definitely going the right way in terms of dealing with pressure by doing other styles of competition to work on my main main one if that makes sense yeah cool and it's just gutting for those of us who go to work at exhibition love it freddie comes along it's not really that fast and goes and wins the thing but you know it's fine we'll all get over it i'm fast now <laughs> yeah yeah oh now you're fast <laughs> What? No, now you've won a few. Now you care. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's actually? So, um, what's changed then? Because obviously, we need working expectation is three phase competition. You've got your dressage, then your ease of handling, which is your obstacles under uh, um, style, and then you've got your speed, which is my favorite round because go hell for leather and just get round it. Um, what when you've done well in your dressage which we know you can do because you are a horseman you do know how to ride you work with your horse and it is a really harmonious picture when we say you you ride him really nicely what um what happens to you when you know you've done well in that that dressage because we are a small group there aren't that many of us we are all competitive against each other but the nice thing is we're all still friendly which is good um but you know what happens when you see that dressage score you see that ease of handling and then you've just got that one phase to go what how do you deal with that um, it's a it's a lovely environment, like you said, the the people that we're around. Um, when I've come out the dressage, I've never known I've done well in the dressage. I always it always seems to feel not as nice as it looks. Maybe um, I never quite know how it's how it's gone until I look over and uh, Sue uh, is is my coach, and she's the one that if she's there, I know I've done well or not holly will just say well done anyway that's my partner she'll just say well done and smile anyway whatever whatever the outcome but uh my coach the look on her face that's how i, I know i've done well or not but when you've done the the first two phases and you're in a in a certain position so uh, maybe in the speed you have to win or come in the top two to win the overall competition or things like that um for me I don't it's the good order if i had to do dress size last i would probably be shitting it a lot more um but actually because it's speed last i'm a lot more confident with that with that phase um i know my horse is good i've got a lot of trust in my horse um and through through doing some competitions and going for it it highlighted for me how good that horse is i'll put her at an obstacle and she'll do it and i'll I won't have to be as exact because she'll make up for my mistakes. So by the time we get to the speed, I'm fairly confident and chilled because I know how good my horse is at that point. Um, like I said, switch it around the other way would be a completely different kettle of fish. Um, and I don't know how I'd, how I'd respond until I was in that moment. Um, but yeah, having, having the speed being, being one of the strong points 
uh, the obstacles in general being stronger. Um, I know that Leia, the horse, is gonna gonna come out and and do well. Um, and that's I take a lot of confidence then from my horse um, and the the training um, we've been doing with her. Um, and that's that's it really from yeah. the confidence from the horse. Um, going back to my trick riding um, and the archery. It's a lottery for a horse. So you don't take your horse over there. You pick a number out of a hat and that's your horse. And that's the one you have to perform on. And that's that's that. Whether it's fast, slow, trained, untrained, bolts, scared of the whatever, that's your horse. Because they replicate battle. In battle, you'll get a horse and you have to go and fight on that horse. So that's what that's what they say there. So I can't take my confidence from the horse really in those situations because i get half an hour to try my horse before i have to perform on it then a weapons round and then i'm doing my tricks on it throwing myself on and off it um it's not long enough to know the horse and often my horses uh are a lot better trained than the horses at competitions um obviously i've got more relationship with them as well but the general training of horses uh the competition isn't as good a standard as how we train them over here um so that was another big thing as well uh with competing abroad trying to practice on different horses that weren't as comfortable as my own horse at home um and riding different horses really really helps um so recently i did a show on a different horse that wasn't mine and he only just learned trick riding and that was a great experience for me because i had to do it with a bit of pressure of a show yes it wasn't a competition but it was a different horse that i wasn't quite used to and moved differently and everything like that so things like that really are key um but that's quite an unusual situation unless you do pentathlon which we won't go into um <laughs> now um unless you do pentathlon or a sport which requires you to change horses which isn't very common then you can take your confidence from your horse your relationship with your horse yeah and i think that brings me beautifully onto the next part that i wanted to ask you about which is about horsemanship um because one thing that's really obvious and clear when when i see you out and about is that you have put in the time and the effort to work with that horse to help it understand you know i've seen you riding uh i want to call her layla that's not right is it? it's Leia, isn't it <laughs> um who's the horse obviously um and um i've seen that the the time and the effort that you put in to help her understand what she needs and she's a young horse and you know when i first saw you coming out and and she was new to this and she was like oh you know what am I doing and, and as times progress you've clearly put the, the the training in and the time in to help her understand and build that partnership so for for you what is what is horsemanship what is training what is important to you about it regardless of whether you compete or not what what is it that you would describe horsemanship as um so horsemanship for me is is the understanding that you give the horse for the task that you want really um and it doesn't matter what the task is it doesn't matter what you're asking the horse to do with understanding comes relaxation um so all we are is, is trying to communicate to the horse um in their language so that they understand um, and that's the main thing in their language a lot of people see horses um or try and deal with horses um or teach horses with human language almost or a human perception on things but the horse can't have that human perception the horse has a horse's perception and being the more intellectual being in the partnership we've got to work to what they know um so for me the horse horsemanship the good horsemanship is having a horse that understands is relaxed and willing to do whatever you want it to do because um many horsemen argue this is the right way this is the right way there's a hundred different ways to teach a horse to do something um and lots of people will have an opinion on what's right and what's wrong but for me i try and stay a little bit away from right and wrong because the natural horsemanship nowadays um some bits will intertwine with the cowboys which will intertwine with the old english horsemen which will intertwine with the the Spanish dressage riders, whatever it is, different people have different horsemanship, but it all can be good horsemanship. Um, so for me, me the, the good horsemanship is um, where the horse understands 
and the horse is willing. If the horse is tense, if the horse doesn't understand, if the horse says no or doesn't want to, um, then something's been missed, something's been not explained explained fully to that horse. So my horses um, and horses I train, I like to give them a good start and a good outlet into anything that their owner wants to wants to train so i train a lot of other people's horses and back a lot of other people's horses and i want the horse to go away being able to be a driving horse if they want it to be a driving horse do do some jumping uh go into an unknown situation and be comfortable ride on the beach whatever their goal is or whatever their dream is i want the horse to be set up for that so they ask the question they all go yeah let's have a go rather than no why should I or no I'm scared I don't want to so my own personal horses um I want them to be able to do anything um so like I said earlier pulling uh, a snowboard in the snow I don't train my horse to pull a snowboard in the snow but with the training that I do when it does get snowy the horse is okay with pulling things the horse understands that we've done that when he was backed he's also willing and trusting of me in new situations so I put him in that new situation I explain that new situation to him and he's very willing and happy to do that um, and that for me uh, that's just one example but that for me that willingness to try a new situation and go okay I'm not sure but I'll trust you that's horsemanship through and through so whatever situation I want to put my horse in they're like okay yeah let's go if I've got a filming job and uh, they have to go in a black a dark blacked out room with cameras all the way around 360 degrees all the way around him and, and be calm I can't train that because I don't have I don't have that much money to buy that many cameras. Um, but my horse, my horse trusts me. I'll put training steps in, in place um, to make or help the situation go the right way and help the horse understand that every situation that he's in is okay because it always has been and always will. So that's where your duty as a, as a rider, as a handler comes into play, to not let a situation go, go wrong or go bad with the horse, so to speak. And even if it does, it doesn't matter because that's when I get horses in for training. It's like, okay, I've had a little blip, we'll help you on your right way. It's, it's, it is a blip, so ideally it's to be avoided, but it's not the end of the world. Um, as long as you're putting your horse in a situation that he's, he's happy with, um comfortable in and then slowly build from there chucking him straight in at the deep end with not much training is going to cause that blip but little steps step by step all the way um for me little steps little steps little steps um is is the way to keep building the confidence with the horse and i suppose it's the same with people it's the same it's the same thing if you're doing um little positive steps all the way you're going to end up going the right direction hundred percent yeah love that and it is the same I mean a model that I talk about all the time with human psychology is something called the comfort zone the stretch and the learning and then outside of it's the panic and I'm not going to go into it now because this isn't a training session but you're right it it works with animals and with and with humans in that we have what we're happy with in our comfort zone and we're happy to do it and then outside of that is we've got to try something new if we push too quickly too far into panic what actually happens our comfort zone shrinks and we're less willing to give it a go but if we keep pushing that bit by bit that one percent one to ten percent into the learning zone never more than that and then we have to do what's called normalize it which means that you get into that and you do it again and again and again until it becomes normal or embedded and then we're okay to do it and it's fine and I love what you say about you cannot train for every situation so there's a lot of talk isn't there always about like spook busting oh let them spook bust my horse so you you, you know a lot of dressage horses will go to something and they'll, they won't like an umbrella or a flag and then everyone comes home and goes right well we'll get them used to umbrellas and flags and then when they go out to the environment again they don't like a different umbrella or a different flag because their brains don't work the same way whereas I've always said with my horses the same thing with you which is he's just got to learn to trust me it doesn't matter what situation it's in he's got to learn that if I say serious you're fine he's got to go okay mom what we what do you want me to do because you I mean I can't believe what we got to do with them the other weekend like that for you is probably totally normal what we did the other weekend um normal so horses that sort of situation I explained uh, what the situation was so we're uh, doing a show at the southwest Iberian and the dressage riders the well uh, the working equitation squad were doing a demonstration with stilt walkers with wings that flapped around and lights and everything like that so I don't know many people, I know a couple, but I don't know many people with stilts at home that have that 
a t chance to train their horses to stilts. And it's the situation I get thrown into all the time with filming and things like that. Will your horse be able to do this or do this or do this on the day in the moment? A lot of the time I can say yes. And the stilt situation is is similar. If your horse is a good foundation and understanding and willingness to trust you. And these horses all did in this performance because it was uh, a morning half an hour i suppose to get used to the stilts then we'll go and do a do a performance with them all those horses had a good relationship with their rider and understanding that they trusted them enough to do a performance with these these stilts and lights and things waving around um now if these these horses hadn't had a foundation of some desensitizing to things moving riding in in that sort of environment either at a competition or show with a with a little crowd you put in some preparation steps in if there's no preparation steps these horses wouldn't have wouldn't have done that um, but the fact is these horses have had some preparation yes albeit not with stilts but with things moving flapping They've all done competitions before, so they've had an audience and they've had loud music. So these steps are all little steps that we're putting in with the horse to, to help the eventual um, result be, be a positive one. Um, but I'm thrown in those situations all the time, really. I turned up uh, to a photo shoot before um, and, like I said, it was a black blacked out dark room with with cameras all around for the horse um then they added the drone in there then they added all all sorts of things were were added in there and i don't train those situations at home because i don't know the situation i'm walking into but like i said having as much preparation as you can um of different situations and the horse always being okay um you eventually build up to yes you can walk into almost any situation and that's one thing that spurs me on a little bit as well i want to do new and different things that have never been done with horses before um so riding riding through london i've done with a with a different um people i used to work for things like that um drones on the beach um all sorts i want it to become normal 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 so um any any weird and wonderful things horses indoors i take my horses indoors on a semi-regular basis um just for the why not why not why can't we take a why can't we take a horse indoors why can't we do this because all those situations are good training so i don't wait until i get i get a call come through saying oh we've got a job can your horse come in the living room yeah fine because my horse is all i don't have to have the pressure of my horse has to be okay for this job because it's it's randomly done so when i when i go out to my horses and say we're going to do this today and it could be anything i imagine they almost roll their eyes and go oh here we go again he's back this crazy guy and 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 that's how they that's how they see me oh we've got this today and and it's all normal normal uh when i get the fire out with the horses it's it's normal they don't care because i'm always messing around doing something swinging something around like yeah always always being extra uh, around the horses makes them realize that this extra is normal and whether it's extra in terms of a fire or something else or something else for them it's just another crazy crazy idea it's not not anything big or or something like that and I love the little point that you made just then, which is, yeah, why not? Let's work it out. And would you say that that's a belief that you've got, a way of living by that you you have? Of yeah. say for yes, me, and work it out. Me for the horses. That's that's how I live as well. If there's an opportunity to come, yeah, why not? Let's let's give it a try uh, with the horses as well. Yeah, let's see if it's possible. Um, and that's what I love love doing things that might not be possible or the people people think is that even possible with a horse trying it and some things will be yes some things will be no but the training process you're going to have this or the, the training you're going to have while the process of uh, trying to achieve what you're trying to achieve it's all going to be be good and positive and things like that yeah and how do you think having that belief has served you how do you think having that kind of way of working or way of doing things how's that served you to be where you are in life um some things it some things well most things work i mean if you, you throw yourself into something and most of the time if you throw yourself in enough it's gonna it's gonna work yes some don't yes some do but i think um a big thing with that was when i said before i was 
renting the stable and the field at the other yard and, and doing the um, being a student at the yard. That allowed me to have enough stability to start my business and go, yeah, let's try this, let's try this, let's try this. And giving yourself the stability to throw your gamble at an opportunity that you want to achieve, for me, is really, really key. So even now, I train some horses um, and that gives me enough stability to live. Then with my extra time, I don't go train more, 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 more horses. Yes, I'm, I'm quite busy and I train a few, but I leave time to go, I want to do this project. I want to teach my horse to do that. I want to throw myself at that. Um, and that for me is a really, really, really big thing. I've given myself enough stability that if my gamble doesn't pay off, goes completely wrong, I'm still going to have a bed. I'm still going to have food. Um, but at the same time, some of these gambles are going to pay off. And, and then I'm going to be doing different things that I want to do, whether that be a show or a new project or whatever it is. Um, and I've got some things on going at the moment that I can't say too much about. But um, I want to go off and do those do those things. Um, so giving yourself the stability to then go off and, and do what you want and learn more and, and have those gambles um it is risky it is a little bit daunting but actually it's not that big a risk when you've got the stability there as well why not what's there to lose you're not going to be in a worse yes you may, may have slightly less money but you've got enough to live you've got enough to survive. so for me it's like yeah let's take that chance it could blow up into something that i absolutely want to do is amazing or it could go a little bit wrong i could lose a little bit of money but i've tried and let's go for the next one but setting setting up that position i think i'm quite i'm i'm not lucky because I, i've set it up to be that way but um it's it's for me something that's essential um to keep me motivated to keep me going and because if i just did same 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 i'd probably lose interest and i know a lot of horse trainers that have lost interest over time they've done it for 10 to 20 years and they've gone actually no and by that time they're 50 60 i don't want to be 50 60 and then going oh yeah let's try i want to do that now and and everything like that and and go around the world and try these different things and yeah so that's that's where i'm at in the sense of um exploring and making opportunities for yourself and then taking opportunities whether you think they'll work or not go for it why not why yeah. not absolutely i love that i think that's really key is have enough of a foundation, a solid foundation that you can always come back to, always come back to, but go and play and explore and try things and take a risk. And one of the phrases that I love is it's better to regret something that you have done than to gr regret not having done it. And that's yeah. what I live my life by, 100%. I think you're the same, Freddie, which is say yes. God, that sounds amazing. That sounds incredible. That sounds great. Yes, let's do it, even if you don't know how. I've just yeah. done something. I've just said yes to something next year that's going to be absolutely huge. I had no idea how I was going to make it happen. It's now going to happen. And it's terrifying and exciting at the same time. And I think that's the other thing, isn't it? You must live on the line all the time that exists between what is exciting and what is scary. And it's such a fine line. Yeah. I've recently I've been listening to an Ant Middleton podcast as well. And he said, you can't get too comfortable. And I think I'm very much in in that position of, I'll train the horses and I'm comfortable with the training I do, but then I want to expand and go and, and, and do more things. And uh, like Jenny, I've got um, some opportunities coming up end of this year, next year, um, that I've thrown myself into. Um, but that's what excites me and drives me and, and keeps me motivated. And I think the motivation to do more and keep doing what you're doing is the hardest thing um once you're doing something to keep doing it for all these years and you've got to enjoy it you've got to want to do it um and not lose lose the thought of why you originally started doing these things um so for me obviously it all it all revolves around horses um just in different different ways whether it's going to be film tv show training whatever all of all of the above it's going to be um those sort of things that that drive me and let's have a go at this let's try that and, and see what's possible awesome okay some quick fire questions before we finish so what is a oh, quick fire question here's one 
What is your reason why? <laughs> as quickly as you can, Freddie. What's your reason why? Why what? Why anything? Why why well, do you do what you do? Why why are you the way you are? What's, so, it, what's it all about for you? All about horses. All about horses. I love the animal. I love the connection that's possible with the animal. Um, and for me, it was therapy. Horses are therapy. Horses and dogs for me are therapy. Horses even more so. Um, I've had a bad day. Go out with the horse, and it will become okay. So those, that's why. That's why I do it all. Really. Uh, awesome. Okay. What do you know for sure? Uh, what do I know for sure? Nothing. No, no, I don't know. I don't know anything for sure. Things change. Things change by the day. Uh, one minute I think I know how to train a certain type of horse, and another horse comes along and it blows everything out. I've now got to think outside the box. So uh, yeah, don't take anything. Don't take anything for granted. Would be my advice with that one. Nothing's for sure. Um, cool. Yes, you've got. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah. No, that's cool. Okay. Um, what do people wrongly assume about you? Um. Hmm. That's an interesting one. Um, people wrongly assume that I'm crazy and not not um normal, not the same as them. Especially with the trick riding, the stunt riding, they think, "Oh, you must be nuts." But actually, it's all just uh risk assessing and having a having a way out of every every situation and and having the answer so yeah i'm i'm not that crazy only a little bit <laughs> amazing i love i actually love that because i think you're entirely right i think a lot of people that see people doing tricks or stunts or anything that seems a bit way out there or different or um higher up perhaps on the adrenaline scale think that someone's crazy but actually having gotten to know you seeing the processes you do even getting the privilege to do some training with you with my horse and thing uh, you just you actually see how actually completely logical you are how you break it down how you work it out how there's a plan in place it's just the finished polished object that goes out there and gets seen on stage yeah. or wherever it is you know competition, yeah. whatever doesn't seem that way but that's the skill i think and that's the performance isn't it that is performance performance is actually all about planning and preparation that's it when you're out there in front of everyone it is it is the polished finished article it is the performance behind that it goes wrong a hundred times you sort it out a hundred times and, and you find every which way to sort out any any situation that could happen um so the finished article is is the wow that's the show that's what people like but actually underneath it's a lot of a lot of different different ways out and, and situations and answers to to what could happen and doesn't usually happen because you put everything in play really yeah cool and we haven't had a chance and we've run out of time now as well to chat to you about you know encouraging boys in the sport and things like that so maybe we'll have you back on freddie at another time to discuss that topic yeah. so i know it's obviously really um key to your heart it's a really interesting topic i know you spend a lot of time like teaching little boys things that they find interesting in horse riding as well to keep the yeah. passion yeah. and and there's this massive gap, like you see the little boys in pony club and then you see them out on the world eventing or show jumping stage or dressage and you think, where did they go in between? Um, yeah. So I think that's something that I'd love to have you back on to chat about at some point, Freddie. So I think we're gonna have to wrap it up for today. Yeah. Um, but what is one key thing or takeaway or something that you would love, if there's one thing you can inspire people with, what would it be that you're gonna leave with us today to say as, as your gift to the people watching, listening, um from you Freddie I think you've got to be back to that point we were saying of giving yourself enough foundation to go out and take any opportunity make opportunities for yourself and, and find out what drives you and and go and take that go and do that because not enough people take these opportunities and we don't want to we don't want to have the what ifs in our mind after um Go out and take it, like Jenny said. That uh, I've forgotten the quote, but it's a good one. Um, better, then, better to regret what you have done than regret not having done it. Yeah, I think that that's the quote of the day, and, and very much exactly the same as as my mentality. Um, that you you've got to do it. You've got to give it a go. 
there we go guys so hopefully if you're listening in or if you're watching in live and you're listening back to the podcast now maybe if you could take away one thing what are you going to go and do differently like what foundations have you got in place and if they're not there what are you going to do to get them in place so that you can go and take a few risks do something a bit differently throw caution to the wind a little bit you know like um we're not talking about going and doing something you haven't got the skills for you're not capable of or your horse isn't okay with we're talking about get that stuff in place so that you can do it and so much of the time I speak to people that want to go and do something, um, but they haven't got those foundations in place. And as soon as they start working towards those foundations, they feel so much happier about that end goal and how they're going to do it. So take that away. That's an amazing one. Um, I think we're going to call this podcast something around like how to take risks safely <laughs> and throw caution to the wind. You know. So thank you so much, Fred. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch with you or reach out to you, ask you any questions, see where you're at, what you're doing, follow your progress, how do they do that? Um, so I'm on social media, um, Instagram and Facebook, Freddie Steele, or my business name is Steel Horse, uh, with an E on the steel. I'm the only one on there. Um, and, yeah, my, my profile's um, Steel Horse. has the logo. I think I might have it here. Yeah, the little S. Um, and Freddie Steele will be someone probably standing up on a horse or doing some sort of trick riding that'll be me um so yeah no um please please reach out um and then anything really whether it's it's for you for the horse moving forward whatever yeah reach out and thank you jenny for having me having me on it's been great fun thank you so much for coming i didn't think you'd say no because i know what you're like freddie should we do this yeah okay fit me in um let's go let's take it that's the one exactly cool and you never know where these things go do you i know i've had some times in life and i've looked back and i've gone oh my god i was terrified of taking that opportunity at the time but i'm so pleased i did it now not that you were terrified of this obviously but you know sometimes to take an opportunity and you never know where it's going to go so thank you so much Freddie. it's been an absolute pleasure having you today and uh, and i hope to see you out and about soon no doubt there'll be something we're out together soon competition or uh, something crazy and uh, and uh, take care. Bye. Uh, thank you.